Go ahead and take out your Bibles and turn with me over to Luke, Luke 18, whether we're here in person or online with us this weekend. We are in a series, and we're going to continue in that series. Prayer is a circle thing. And um, I want to just challenge you. Um, I threw out a challenge the very first week of this series, a 52-week challenge, which leads us right up to Easter weekend. And uh, uh, that we will we would be praying bold, uh, risky uh, prayers, challenge us to dream. Um, and I want to continue with that by just starting this weekend by asking, when was the last time you actually allowed yourself to dream? When was the last time you actually allowed yourself to dream? Was it this morning? Was it this past week? Maybe for some of us, um, maybe you once dreamed about, uh, maybe it was years ago. Maybe the last time you actually allowed yourself to dream about family, uh, about yourself personally, about the church, about the community, about a ministry um, that you, that well was welling up inside of you, that you were dreaming about what could happen, where, where God could go with that. But for whatever reason, you're not dreaming about it anymore. You stop praying about it. It's not on your mind. It's, it's kind of, it, it, it's buried deep within your very being. For whatever reason, you stop. Maybe it's as a church. Maybe it's individually. Maybe it's personally. So let me ask you this. Whether it be, whether you've dreamed recently, or maybe it's something that, Maybe it's, it's in the past, you haven't allowed yourself to dream. How big was that dream, or how big is your dream? How big is your dream for you personally? How big is your dream for your family? How big is your dream for us as a church, and for the church, for God's church as a whole? How big is your dream for this community? For your grandkids. Maybe for your great-grandkids. You know, how big are your dreams? Uh, what I've found is the bigger your dreams, the harder you have to pray. You can write that down. The bigger your dreams, the harder you have to pray. There's a time when Jesus was with the disciples, and he shares a story that we want to just dive into this weekend. And that... When as he's sharing the story, the reason he shares the story is, is to give the disciples an understanding how they should pray and that they should never give up. Is there something that maybe over the past several years or maybe years ago you used to pray about, but it just didn't seem like God was answering your prayers, so you gave up? Anybody? Anybody want to raise your hand? Anybody want to stand up for that? Maybe this past week you've prayed about something and you've been praying about it for a while. Maybe you've been praying that somebody would, you've, you've been inviting someone to, uh, to come and, and, and to come to church. Or maybe you've been praying for someone to surrender their life to Christ. And it just doesn't seem, nothing seems to be moving. Well, Jesus is sharing with the disciples what we're about to look at through this story, not to give up. This is, this is Jesus. Jesus is sharing the story. And this is what he says. He says, there was a judge in a certain city. He said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. But he finally said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. But this woman is driving me crazy. Guys, don't amen there. I'm going to see that she gets justice. Because she's wearing me out with her constant request. Now here's the kind of the context, if you will, of why Jesus is sharing this. This parable is about a persistent widow. That's obvious. Who shows us what... Uh, uh, and Jesus is sharing this to show us what prayer life and what praying hard actually looks like. 
crying out until your voice is lost. Falling to your knees and crying into and, and pleading with God and praying and, 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 and with tears running down your eyes until you have no more tears. See, praying hard is actually praying through. And so often what happens in our prayer lives is just on the verge of something is when we stop praying. And that's what Jesus is sharing with the disciples. And that's what Jesus is sharing with us. See, there comes a moment when you need to pray for the impossible. There comes a moment when we need to muster up the courage. We've talked about taking the risk. We need to muster up the courage, the faith, to ask God for an outpouring from heaven. To be like this persistent widow. To be in our prayer lives in such a way that we are literally constantly wearing God out. With our request. Now, we don't know what this woman was nagging this judge about. We don't know why she was so persistent. We don't know what was going on. We're not shared the backstory. All Jesus is sharing with the disciples and all Jesus is sharing with us is to see the persistence, what was taking place, and what transpired because of how persistent this woman was. So let me ask you this weekend. How desperate are you for a miracle? How desperate are you for a miracle? How desperate are we as a church for a miracle? How desperate is God's church as a whole for a miracle? How desperate within this community are we for a miracle? How desperate are we? Are we desperate enough to pray all the way through the night? I don't know how many of you remember this or realize this, but this past week, I was uh, uh, doing some work, and I was over on the other side of the building, and I was up in the very top, in the top stairway uh, of the classrooms, and I got to the very end of the hallway. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Those of you online, I realize you don't realize what I'm talking about, but those in person this weekend, at the very end of the hallway, there's a room, and I opened up that room, and it hit me. I, I just, it, it, I, I remembered immediately what that room used to be for us as a church. Anybody remember what it used to be? It was a prayer room. It was a prayer room. It's where it was set aside that you could go up and pray. Now, how many of you realize that or knew that? church that's located out in the Midwest. Their minister resigned. Um, no one knew he was going to resign. And he resigned and they were kind of just in a flood of what to do. They weren't really sure where direction. They knew that God had a plan. They had huge dreams as a church. They, they, the church was started based on uh, dreams that they felt like the people that started the church said God wanted them to accomplish something to do something in this in the community where they were planted, and they just didn't know what to do. So the leader of this church, the the elders of this church, uh, they uh, they had big dreams, and they decided that they would contact a, a minister that they just felt like had laid upon their heart to come and be their minister. 
They actually brought him in. They talked to him. They talked to his family. Through the conversation, he just he wasn't sure if this was really where God wanted him. And he eventually had told him no. So the story goes that the elders of this church and, and one of the ministers on staff that was still there, uh, they decided that they were going into the worship area and they were going to spend time in prayer one evening and they just decided, they, they all as a group made the decision, we are not going to leave this worship area until God gives us an answer of direction on where we're supposed to go, or who God leads to us to a minister. So here you have these group of elders that are praying in this worship area with one staff member. And unbeknownst to them, they're unaware that who they think should be their minister, who they think God is leading to come, has already told them no. He's actually interviewing with another church in Indianapolis. And at the very time that they are praying in the worship auditorium, he's in an interview at a church in Indianapolis. And something is said, uh, from my understanding, was said in that interview that let him, or he knew that he was not to accept the position in Indianapolis. Now, neither one knew what was going on. So while the elders and this staff member are praying in the worship auditorium, Remember, they made a commitment. We're not going to leave until God gives us an answer. All of a sudden, the phone starts to ring. And the staff member gets up, and he goes and answers the phone. Gets off, after he gets off the phone, walks back into where these group of men are praying. And he says, men, we can stop praying. Our prayers have been answered. We now have a minister. And the minister that was, the guy that was interviewing in Indianapolis called. As soon as he walked down the interview, called and said, hey, if you still want me, I will come and be your minister. At the time, that church was running 121. They now run over 3,000. The average age of that church was 21 at the time. He was 64. They had huge dreams. They still have huge dreams. I don't tell that story to put some other church on a pedestal. I tell that story is how big are our dreams? How big? How, how desperate are we for a miracle? How much do we actually believe? We talk about people all over the world. As far as the Christ, they talk about that we believe in God. We believe in the power of God. But do we really believe what we say we believe? How desperate are we? What I know in my young life, at 51 years of age, is the more desperate you are, you'll take desperate measures. Have you found that out to be true? And if you aren't desperate, you won't take desperate measures. And if you don't, Pray like it depends on it, then God, the biggest miracles, the best promises will remain out of reach. But if we pray hard, and what Jesus is sharing with us, if we'll pray persistent, God will honor our bold prayers. Now, write this down God always answers prayer. Now, this series isn't about some genie in a bottle and all our wishes and all that come true. But God always answers prayer. Sometimes his, his answer is no. Sometimes it's not now. Sometimes it might be, well, if you think you really need this, then okay, here it is. See, here's the thing. If you look back at the widow and how persistent she was, her methodology was really messed up. It was really messed up. She could... She could have, if you really think about it, this judge, he went one direction and granted her request. He actually probably, I mean, she shows up at his house. She probably should have been thrown in jail. Think about it. The judge had the power to do that. He probably should have just, he could have silenced her. You know what he knew? He knew if I throw her in jail, she's still not going to be quiet. She's still going to drive me crazy. And what 
Jesus is doing it is that he's revealing to us something about the nature of God. You see, God could care less about protocol. God could care less about protocol. If he did, then Jesus would have chosen, when Jesus were walking amongst his creation, then Jesus would have chosen the Pharisees. Jesus would have chosen the religious leaders. But that isn't who Jesus honored, is it? Think about this. Jesus honored the prostitute who crashed a party at a Pharisee's home to anoint his feet. Jesus honored the tax collector who climbed, climbed a tree in his three-piece suit just to get a glimpse of Jesus. Jesus honored the four friends. Do you remember? They cut out the ceiling and they wanted their friends so desperately to be in the presence of Jesus because they knew that Jesus could heal him. That they, what, they cut out the ceiling and, and they lowered him down in front of Jesus amongst all those people that were watching? Here's the thing. If you look at all these stories I just shared, including the persistent widow, what's the common denominator? Each one took desperate measures to get to God. Each one took desperate measures to get to God. And what does God do with that? God honors that. God honors that. And here's the thing. Nothing's changed. You're going to hear me say it, and you've already heard me say it. The same God of the Old Testament, who is the same God of the New Testament, is the same God that we are in the presence of this weekend. We have to start to wrap our minds around that. He's the same God. And God is still honoring the same thing. Bold prayers, persistent prayers. If you look with me, if you look, there's a time in the life of Elijah... You can go back and read it later over in 1 Kings chapter 18. It hasn't rained, I believe, for three years. And then the Lord promises Elijah that he would send rain. What does Elijah do, though? Elijah climbs to the top of Mount Carmel. He falls face down and he starts praying for rain. And he tells his servant, he says, he asks him to go and to look and to see if he sees rain. Six times he told his servant to go look toward the sea, but there was no sign of rain. Now here's the thing. Six times. Most of us don't even make it to six. We stop praying at two or three or four times. We might make it to five. And then we just stop. Elijah had been praying for six times. Elijah was on his knees, face down, praying, sending his sermon out. No sign of rain, no sign of rain. But what happens? On the seventh time, on the seventh time, God answers his prayer. Elijah would have prayed, I believe, a hundred thousand times if that's what it would have took. See, after seven, after the seventh time, Elijah's servant, as he strained his eyes, saw a small cloud, the size, the size of a man's hand, rising up out of the sea. Now. I want to address, if you will, the elephant in the room. What if Elijah would have stopped? If Elijah would have stopped at the sixth prayer. If he wouldn't have prayed seven times. If he would have stopped at six. What's the answer? Well, the obvious answer is, and here, write this down. The obvious answer would have, have he would have defaulted on the promise. He would have forfeited his miracle. In other words, Elijah, because he was willing to keep praying, he was allowing himself to experience, not just himself, but who else is there? The servant got to see God do a miracle. See, so often what happens is we fall short. We're not persistent enough. We give up too soon. We think, oh, God's not there. God doesn't hear us. God's not answering our prayers. No, God always answers our prayers. It might be not now. It might be wait. It might be that, hey, yeah, that prayer sounds great. Yeah, that dream sounds great. But I want to do something even more amazing than you. 
what to do. My dream for you is even bigger. My dream for your church is even bigger. See, it's so easy for us to give up on our dreams. It's so easy for us to give up on our ideas. It's so easy for us to give up on the promises of God that we see all throughout Scripture. We're not patient. This past week, and or this past week, we had a brand new internet put in. Why? Because we're not patient enough. It's got to move faster. Fast food is not fast food anymore, is it? You, that's it. Do you do you all remember the old dial-up service? You remember when we internet when we first knew we had internet? Finally, you have internet. An hour later, now we can't get it fast enough. Now we can't get our phone moving fast enough. Now we can't watch a video fast enough. Same thing happens with our prayer life. God can't move fast enough. It's so easy to give up. We just give up. Even after a three year drought, even with severe depression that Elijah was struggling from, Elijah still believed that God could send rain. And guess what God did? He did it. And you know what? Since God is the same God, the God that did it for Elijah is the same God that wants to do it for you, wants to do it for me, wants to do it for his church, wants to do it for this community, and wants to do it for his creation. Here's the thing. The most pow powerful prayers are prayers that are supernaturally linked to the promises of God. Here's the thing. When you know that you're praying, so have, have you ever prayed, God, if this be your will? Have you ever prayed? Let's just, let's just throw it out. Have you ever prayed, God, if it's your will, please, will you allow, and you fill in the blank, such and such to come to Christ? Have you ever prayed that? You're honest? Why do we ask God if it be your will? It is God's will that all might come to who, who he is. Might come to have a relationship with him. But why? If it's your will. In other words, we don't hold on to the promises of God. We don't understand or we lack the understanding of the promises of God. And we do that all throughout scripture. All throughout our lives. Even in my life, I know I've asked God. God, if it's your will. Well, God has already painted for us a picture in scripture that it is his will. Then why in the world do we ask him if it's his will when he's already said? Because he's already promised it. He's already promised it to us. By most conservative estimates, there are more than 3,000 promises in Scripture. That's on a conservative estimate. There's over 3,000 promises in Scripture. And by virtue of what Jesus did on the cross, by virtue of what we've already celebrated this weekend through communion, all those promises we see in Scripture, if you've surrendered your life to Christ as a follower of Christ, those promises belong to you and they belong to me. Every one of those promises has your name on it and has my name on it. 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 20 says, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, our amen which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. So the question is, do we believe in the promises of Scripture? And then how many of those promises do we hold on to and do we pray over? Let me say that again. How many of the promises in Scripture do we actually truly believe in? And then how many of those promises do we circle up, do we pray over? 
over? Do we pray through them? See, what I want to share with us, and here, if you're asked to say, how do I take all this? How do I take the time in Elijah's life? How do I take the story that Jesus shared with the disciples? How, do, how, how does that fit in 2021? Yeah, that sounds good, Jonathan, but how does that, here's the thing. Here's what I believe will totally, if we will put this into practice as a church, if we'll put it into practice in our families, I believe this will revolutionary our prayer lives. It will totally flip our prayer lives upside down. Is that we look at the way we pray and we look at the way we read scripture differently. See, so often through so many things in our life, it goes back to that box illustration I used in the last series. We take prayer and it's over here. And we take scripture and it's over here. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And we do our prayer life and we have our scripture life, but they don't mesh. They don't mesh at all. But what if they are supernaturally linked? What if the power of God is linked to that? What if we pray through Scripture as we read through Scripture? It becomes our prayer. What is it, instead of just reading through Scripture, we actually pray through Scripture? So often, a lot of us, we don't know what to pray for or how to pray. Or really, when we start to ask, you know, when I went back and told you to, to, to actually um, write down five people that you want to see come to know a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that God will use you. For some of us, maybe we don't have five people. Maybe we don't have one. That's the first place we start. We start praying. So often, we don't know what to pray for. Or we don't know the promises of Scripture. We don't know the promises that God has already given to us. Therefore, we fall short on our prayer lives. So here's the challenge for us. Here's the application. Here's where it all meets. Is that we start to change the way we read the Bible. We change the way we read Scripture. See, I, I'm a firm believer that the Bible wasn't just meant to read through. <coughs> Several years ago, in fact, my, uh, my youngest, Jenna, she is, uh, she, uh, she, she in class this week, in her history class, they were going through some things, actually, some things studying of the Bible in history. You know, you can't study history without studying the Bible. You all know that, right? As often as we often try, you have to look at Scripture to, to actually even study history. You want to know what's going on over in, in the Middle East? Study the Bible. And, and her question was, she said, Dad, what, how, what's, the, have you, what's the quickest you've ever met someone that read through Scripture? Several years ago, I had the opportunity to travel on a mission trip uh, to go over into Cambodia and uh, Thailand. And the missionary I was with, when we got on um, the plane, we got, got all excited because there was this gentleman that was sitting there. And he had uh, um, uh, this big uh, book. And, and, and as we started to talk through on our flight and started talking through the conversation, come to find out it, it was a Bible that he'd been reading and that he'd had in his possession for years. Get this. This guy... For years, had read through the entire Bible once a month. For years, he had things highlighted, he had things written out, he had things marked, and over and over and over again. But here's the thing: he knew the Word of God better than I knew the Word of God. He knew Scripture, all different. I mean, he had read it, but he did not have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He had surrendered his life to Christ. Wasn't even on his radar. See, I think so many of us, we just read scripture 
A lot of us read scripture. Here's the application. Here's the challenge. That we transition. That we change. And that we actually pray through scripture. That we pray through the promises of God. Let me give you an example. Over in Acts chapter 2, as you read the, toward the very end of Acts chapter 2, we all study and we all understand and you've heard sermons on it and you've heard people talk about it and, and we hold on to it. In Acts chapter 2, we talk about how uh, th this amazing message was delivered by Peter and, and the disciples. And what does it say? It says that over 3,000 gave their life to Christ that day. It says they were cut to the heart. At the very end of that passage, though, at the very end of Acts chapter 2, we kind of just skip over what it says. It says that they came together, that they started meeting together. They were breaking bread together. But there's a small sentence in there. There's a promise in there. It says, and God did what? Anybody know? That God added to their number what? Daily. Those that were being saved. That's a promise of God. We don't have to pray, God, if it be your will to add to your church. God wants to add to his church. God wants to rain down his blessings upon his church. He wants to add to the church's number daily. Instead of just reading that, we pray through that. And as we pray, and as we hold on to the promises of God. Here's another promise. You remember Doubting Thomas? Thomas gets a bad rap. But anyway, we call him Doubting Thomas. How would you like to be called Doubting? What if first I had to go, well, there's Doubting Jonathan right there. A lot of us are doubting. We're just not called Doubting. You know that? A lot of us are doubting. But here's the thing about Thomas. Thomas said, I won't believe until what? Until I actually can touch where those nails, this, the, where those nails were at. I, I won't believe until I actually can put my hand. A lot of us are like that. We say, I won't believe. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to reach out. I'm not going to believe until I see it. You know what happened? Thomas actually experienced that. Thomas got to touch the hands of Jesus where those nails were. Thomas got to touch the side of Jesus where that, 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 that sword pierced his side. And then what does Jesus say? Here's another promise. We don't pray through it. We don't hold on. Tom, he says, great is your faith, but greater is the faith what? Your faith is because you have seen. Greater is for those faith. Greater is the faith. In other words, greater is our faith because we've not seen. That's a promise. That is a promise. See where I'm going with that? All throughout Scripture, there are these promises that we can pray through, that we can circle up, that we can pray around. I'm not asking if it be your will. God's already shown us over and over and over again. It is His will to open up His floodgates. And rain down his blessings upon his church, upon his bride. As we do that, as we look at scripture differently, as we allow ourselves to actually, instead of just look at scripture, something we read, but actually a prayer that we pray through, you take the Holy Spirit and you put all that together. Our very being inside starts to stir. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 says this. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us. Get this. With groaning. That can't not be expressed with words. See, and even in times in our lives when we don't know what to pray, 
A lot of times we just read that. But if you pray through that, if you look at that, there's a promise. What is? If we don't know what to pray, if we are in such a dire strait, if we are in such a situation that we don't know what to pray, what does it say here? Here's the promise. That the Holy Spirit on our behalf will pray for us in such a way. What does it say? With groanings. That's a promise. That's a promise. So in our 52-day challenge of prayer, are we willing to add this part into our challenge? Instead of just looking at Scripture, As we spend time with God in prayer, that we don't have our prayer life and we don't have our Bible life, but we join them together and move supernaturally together. As God rains down and God wants to rain down these miracles and open up the floodgates of heaven around this church. Will you stand with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the great opportunity to be in your presence this weekend. God, I just pray that we will look at your word differently. I pray that we'll look at our lives and our differently. God, I pray that we will allow ourselves in your presence to dream. Pray we'll allow ourselves to be willing to take risks. Father, I pray that you will stir amongst, amongst us as a church. I pray that we will allow ourselves to, to seek out the opportunities that are already there, that you've already given to us. That God, all we have to do is be willing to step through. Father, stir us in our prayer lives. Father, may you lead us and guide us as a church. May you lead us and guide us individually and personally. May, may you grant us wisdom and discernment. Father, may we allow you to forgive us. Father, may we see these amazing promises that you have all throughout your word. These promises you give to us in the old and the new. And Father, all around us. May we look at life differently. Again, I thank you for all that you do for us. And for all your blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.